Okay. All right. After some technological difficulties, we are here with um, Constance Lynn and Hope for Healing uh, Talks, and she's going to tell us about her journey, which is just an amazing and incredible story that you all need to hear, um, both of hope and of caution. I think that she would agree with that because mm -hmm. Um, Constance happens to be a nurse uh, practitioner, and so she is medically trained um, and has been, you know, she's medically trained and she went through the system as a trained professional, and she still had problems getting the proper care that she needed. Things were overlooked um, that shouldn't uh, that should have maybe been addressed ahead of time. And so these are really uh, important things to remember when you're talking to your, um, to your doctors and when you're advocating for yourself. Um, so what we're here to do today is just empower you to speak up for yourself and also um, play a role in your own medical care. So I want Constance to tell you a little bit about herself and then we're going to go into her story and questions. And uh, if you're watching this in replay, go ahead and drop your um, questions and comments here. We'll be able to answer them after the fact. This was originally uh, meant to be a live, um, a live interview, but we had to record it. So if you have some questions, go ahead and drop those and we will take care of them after the fact. Okay, so thank you so much for dealing with all the technological issues that we had today. And thanks for sharing your story. It's such um, a powerful one and so important. So tell us about your life now, how things are with you now. Yes, thanks for having me. I'm excited. I'm Constance Lewis and I am a nurse practitioner um, in the Sarasota area. And I have been a nurse practitioner for almost seven years. Uh, before that, I was a NICU nurse for 12 years, kind of all around and in the area. I'm originally from Virginia and moved to Boston for a little bit and then came down to uh, Sarasota. My husband's originally from Florida. So that's how we ended up here and um, worked in the NICU. And right now I just oh, work three days a week and I love being a nurse practitioner and I especially love helping people on their journey because I've had so much experience with it. I feel like I was meant to be there for them. So that's amazing. And I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it for everybody. You have two beautiful children. I do. I have two really beautiful children. I have a three-year-old whose name is Miles. We call him Miracle Miles and I will explain why later. And then we have a second da a daughter. Her name is Mariah and she just turned one recently. So we were busy. Yes. Very busy household. So take us back, Constance, to um, kind of the beginning of your infertility journey and um, how things, how, I mean, hindsight, your hindsight is twenty twenty. You might not have realized it was the beginning of your infertility journey, but when did things start to start to appear to be going sideways for you um, in that area? Yeah. So 29, my husband was residency. Um, we waited, we took the longer route for mm -hmm. educational purposes and wanted to have a stable lifestyle and all that stuff that a lot of women actually lately are doing. They're having children later on in life. So we did that and I uh, had uh, my IUD removed and was really excited, had normal cycles my whole life. Um, they were heavy and extremely painful, but they were normal uh, every month. And so I thought, you know, after the first month, I thought, this is it. I'm excited. We're, we're pregnant. This is, you know, how, how I'm a type A personality. So I expect things to come. I don't have a lot of patience. So I was like, Oh, I said to my husband, I, I hadn't even missed my period three, four weeks pregnant already. I mean, you yeah. know, this is going to be great, you we're know, and snap our fingers and yeah, it, yeah. it works. That's how it works for people. Right. right. So I you know we, we started at age 29 and mm -hmm. um, moved to, from residency from Boston down to Florida. And, you know, it took a while to establish care for, you know, GYN care just from the move and, uh, and starting my new job as a NICU at the nurse and kind of feeling out doctors and things like that. So um, after a year, that all happened in a year. So after a mm -hmm. year of trying, I was kind of like, well, this there's gotta be something going on. Right. Cause yeah. it's not happening. And most people who all my friends who I talked to, it was like on the first try or within four months or at least by six months. So like mm -hmm. something's going on here is, you know, that where it kind of tipped out. Yeah. 
And so you had your IUD removed, you tried for a year, mm -hmm. and then you're not getting pregnant. So what's your next step at that point? Yeah. So, I mean, as you know, they say in, in fertility, yeah, right. <laughs> the year is where we're not going to do right. anything for you, you know, right. unless you're five. So, right, right. so that's like the standard. Um, yeah. and so I'm like, okay, well, I'm not, a, I'm not 35, I'm 29 now 30. So, you know, um, let's just Oh, just relax, have a glass of wine, you know, all the stuff that everybody tells you, right? right. You're too stressed, you're thinking about it too much. Yeah. So, um, very was, helpful like, advice too for very all of us. Yeah. All that advice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, at, at, at a year, I was like, okay, I had OBGYN. I'm like, I had a conversation. I said, you know, I think, you know, we're, she said, yeah, let's go ahead and order some blood work, the very standard women and most women take on that responsibility of fertility um right. mostly you know it's it's our job to be pregnant it's be it's our job to have all the tests most of them anyway so it's kind yeah. of that burden that you burden slash you know gift that we're given as a woman right despite the that. yeah despite the fact that almost a third of infertility is caused by male infertility correct right yeah so um, we did blood work and, um, it, it, um, and you know, the, the, the blood work with the HSG or the histosalpingogram was kind of the scheduled step for right, us right. along with the semen sample. Mm -hmm. And, um, we kind of all did those kind of things and the semen sample was normal and, um, the blood work came back and I was told by my practitioner, um, that everything looked levels looked normal. Everything mm -hmm. looked normal at that point. And I didn't, right. and I was actually in nurse practitioner school at this time. Right. Uh, I was on my last rotation and I was actually in my infertility rotation, GYN rotation through mm -hmm. it. So, um, I just said, Oh, okay. My blood work looks great. You know, I was going to look at it myself, but I just wasn't in a hurry. I was told yeah. it looked good. I was like, okay, this is perfect. And so a couple weeks went by. And so let me just ask you, do you remember it's okay if you don't, but do you remember what that typical blood panel was that they, yeah, I do. So like FSH and LH level luteinizing mm -hmm. follicle stimulating hormone, obviously the day seven day post ovulation, mm -hmm. um, drone and the AMH level level, which is the anti-malarian hormone, your estradiol. And, um, the, we throw in testosterone. I think I had a testosterone, a DHEA, right. things like that. Just the basic prolactin, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So those were all the blood work that I had done. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I said, all right, great. I'm glad everything's normal, which is sometimes good and bad. Cause you're like, oh, great. Everything's normal. But then right. you're like, well, well, well what's, what's going on? If right. everything's normal, what's going on? Exactly. Right. Yeah. I think it was about two weeks later that I happened to just, I was like, oh, let me, you know, I was really learning about the lab levels in my fertility mm -hmm. class. And so I'm like, let me just go. And I, we were diving deep into that. So I'm like, let me just go into my lab, my patient portal and actually take a look at my own lab level and I saw my AMH level and I was in shock because it was not normal, not even close to being normal. I mean, one and above is considered that an AMH level is basically a level that tells you how many eggs that you mm -hmm. have. I mean, it doesn't give you a specific number of how many eggs, but it says you have eggs in your ovaries right. left, you know, cause we, we know we're born with the norm, the number of eggs that were given our whole entire lifetime. Right, right. right. So, this number is indicating that you have eggs left. So I saw yours that was first. yours was what zero. It was 0.13. So 0 0.13. It wasn't even less, point than, five, one. less right. than one, less uh, traumat yeah. dramatically less than one. Right. So I was in shock and I just, I was actually at my clinical, like I was at, um, sitting there they're in the, the doctor's office nurses station with mm -hmm. my, my preceptor. And I just, I couldn't move. And I was just staring at the computer and she was, did like, it feel like someone sh like, must've felt yeah. like a physical blow at that point. Yeah. Right. Like you're Somebody, trying to, yes. are you trying to hold it together and yes, yeah. trying to hold it together, trying, like I, like it was, 
because I knew what it meant. Right. I knew the ramification, but I also wanted to be professional and I shouldn't have looked at it while I was at work, but we were just talking about it, not at yeah. work, but at the clinical, we were having a discussion about it yeah. with my clinical and um, preceptor. And she's like, yeah, you know, let's look. And then it was just like, we both kind of looked at each other. So step one is told I had normal blood work and I didn't have blood work. And right. granted, I took a look at it myself, but if you, if it, it happened to be that I was at in school. So I knew it was abnormal. You know, yeah. if I didn't take that step to investigate, I would have gone on with not knowing it wasn't abnormal. Right. Right. So that and was, I, yeah. And we advocate a lot in here for having copies of your own blood work and being responsible for that, looking at the ranges and seeing if you can identify anything that is outside of the range. So, yeah. And I, and as a nurse practitioner that deals with the time. I want you to do that. Yeah. I, I do not find it offending and I, and I'm not intimidated by that at when patients come with, with prepared with blood work, with questions and dive deep into it. It's, yeah. it's a great thing. So if your practitioner isn't like that practitioner for you. Yeah. That's amazing. So then, collaborative uh, care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the HSG or the histosalpharyngeal still, I, I'm still moving forward with this you know, journey because you right. still got to check off all the boxes. I mean, there's a yep. list of diagnostic tests before you get a, um, an actual diagnosis. Right. 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 Um, even though we had, we were pretty clear of what the diagnosis was at that point. Yeah. Uh, no, but, but at that point we're like, okay, well, so I, I, I went to go have the HSG done and the radiologist could ask the catheter through my cervix and, it was an extremely painful procedure. Um, you know, just I, anyone's ever done it, you know, you know, most people, I think probably 50, 50, if I had to estimate or do fine, they have no pain. And then people, it's just super traumatic and the right. pain is extreme. Um, and I was one of those patients, but he couldn't get the catheter in. So he's like, well, you know, and he was wonderful. They were wonderful, but he was like, you know, I do these all the time. It's not like I haven't done them, but you know, this catheter won't get in. I can't even do the dye test for you. You need to go see your OBGYN and see sometimes what they do is they have the OBGYN pass the catheter and then you drive back to the place to get the HSG, which is right. a little crazy, but yeah. that's what they do. So I went to my OBGYN and he couldn't get the catheter in either. So long story short is that I had a lot of scar tissue in my cervix. So, um, I've had pelvic pain all my life, probably mm -hmm. I mean, my, my period painful and extremely heavy and missing work. And I started, um, birth control at an early age to control the heaviness in the cycle. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't miss work. I wouldn't bleed through my clothes. It was a lot. Yeah. And I was misdiagnosed multiple times, um, with, um, oh, you have irritable bowel syndrome or, or you have, um, bladder interstitial cystitis, or mm -hmm. you just have cysts on your ovaries. So come short story short is basically long story short is basically I have endometriosis and right. we found that right. out through, so I have a low AMH and endometriosis. So we found that out through a laparoscopy test that my, my physician said, I can't get in through your cervix. This is not normal. There's a bunch of scar tissue in there. Right. Why? I don't know, but you've had this long history and I was new to this OBGYN. So yeah. it, he investigated for me. This was the right. good thing. Right. Yeah. Right. And took me to surgery. Basically he was like, okay, well you have stage, you know, one and two endometriosis, mm -hmm. your scar tissue and your cervix was insane. It was like an S I they are really good and clear it all out and get all the lesions and your, my left ovary was attached to my bladder. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it was a pretty big surgery. Right. And so and I, I want to just stop you because, yeah. um, I want to circle back around to the very beginning where you said, you know, normal, heavy periods, lots of pain and things like that. And, and what I want to do is change the narrative that if you're having that much pain, if you're having that much discomfort during your cycle, that's not normal. That's not, not normal. a normal cycle. That's not normal pelvic to have pelvic pain all the time. That's something that requires additional investigation and additional if attention. Yeah. I couldn't have a bowel movement or urinate in the morning without pain. And that is oh not normal. Gosh. And I saw multiple specialists until I found my OBGYN that finally said, this isn't normal. Let's take you to surgery. And, and you're 30. So you've been menstruating for at least 17 so years, 15 to 17 years, right? Yep. 
Wow. And, you know, endometriosis has become more popular, right? right. Okay. Um, and the other thing about it is too, is that if you read the studies about endometriosis, it go the average, it goes undiagnosed nine years. That's the mm. average. I mean, now I think it's getting better, but yeah. back six years ago when, you know, when I was doing a lot of this research, nine years. So, so, and that's exactly how long it took them to diagnose, right? For somebody right. to finally say, okay, let's take you to surgery because, and not that I'm saying everybody needs to go, right? you know, but yeah, you're right. It took, and, and um, if you actually look at the studies about the typical endometriosis patient, which we're not all typical, so we don't always look at that, but what right. if it's, they say in medical school or nursing school, if it's a horse, it's a horse, it's rarely a zebra, right? Yeah. So, right. You know, white female on the, you know, athletic, thin side, active in school, heavy, you know, there's all mm -hmm. go along with the, with the statistics that come out there. So, you yeah, know, so that was another part of it. So it, it got missed for nine years. That's incredible. Irritable bowel. I was treated with it. You know, it, they were like, you're just, you just, it's all, it's in your head. So it makes you feel crazy. Like you're right. crazy. And now maybe a little angry, right? Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. too, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so once that came out, it was like, okay, well, you have endometriosis and you have it, a low AMH level. Okay. It must be on you. Like this is, is the infertility, right. is, you know, you. And said, hey, you know, a lot of women get pregnant after this procedure, this laparoscopy, right? Laparoscopy, right? They clean everything out. They take out the straighten my cervix. Now we can at least do IUIs, that kind of stuff. Um, minus the fact that your AMH is level, you know, what's the next step. Mm -hmm. So on to the next step, yeah. we decided to do some IUIs, um, with Clomid at this okay. time. Although in my practice, honestly, if I see AMH, AMH, that level, I will say to the person, you need to find a fertility specialist now. Um, yeah to go through IUI is something that I wouldn't recommend. And that's just because the success rate of, of and the money that you're going to spend on it, uh, with my AMH being that low is, mm -hmm. is, is, you know, it's just not going to happen for most very people. similar. Yeah. For us too. We just opted out of that. Right. Right. And I don't know, I thinking back, I don't know why it was just like, okay, well, it's cheaper and mm -hmm. it's just the next step and let's just try it and see. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I had six. Okay. So that's another problem right there. Um, right. Right. I think that if, if I, I would have known that what I know now, obviously 2020 hindsight, I would have right. maybe only done two or three and then kind of been like, all right, like, listen, like my AMH is so low. What's the point? What are we doing? But yeah. I spent them two at my OBGYN's office where they're not as controlled because we're not able to do all the like trigger shots and the mm -hmm. ultrasounds. We're just basic cases. Um, but even at my infertility, but I finally got a referral to my fertility clinic after the second IUI still performed four on me with trigger shots. And mm -hmm. after they did a follicular count on the ultrasound that only showed I had six follicles. So, okay. So, but you ended up with six, if I remember right, if my notes are right, because you switched doctors, right? You had two in the office and then you went to a, one fertility doctor and then you went someplace else, right? For well, a actually, second opinion. I actually hadn't gone someplace else at all yet. I was okay. still with okay. the first fertility specialist for my two IVFs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so we then, go uh, six go ahead, yeah. different times, two in the office, and then we move to a reproductive endocrinologist. And now we've completed six IV, six IUIs, mm -hmm. some with trigger shots, but all of them unsuccessful. Correct. So at this point, then you're like, clearly we just need to move on to IVF. This is not going to work out for me. And then did you switch doctors at that point then? Not yet. Okay. Honestly, at, so at we're in, in Sarasota, there's a small hand picking of fertility. Right. Especially. Yeah. Um, we're not in not a metropolitan city. area. So, right. Yeah. right. I chose to not go with the local person and I chose to go with somebody um, up north in Tampa. And um, that I think there's like was two in Tampa at the time, one in Fort Myers and then one in Sarasota. So, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of just went with word of mouth and 
um, other patient success stories as right. most people do. Yeah. Um, so we did those four IUIs with them and then we said, okay, we're going to, and they, they recommended, okay, you need to move on to I, IVF at this yeah. point. So that's what was next. So, um, you know, first IVF, um, I was, I looked what I expected to look like on an, you know, ovary stimulation round. Mm -hmm. I had six uh, follicles that were stimulating and looking good. Um, and then went three and they got total, they did get a total of six embryos out mm -hmm. and we did, we had opted to, um, not we should just do the the fresh transfer right mm -hmm. so basically they get your embryos and then the next and within three to five days they put one two so we opted for that and um we put in so they don't even let them sit so if you know a lot about ivf sometimes if you're going to do genetic testing on them then you will obviously they'll they'll grow them to the blastocyte stage usually which is day mm -hmm. six five six then they'll take a sample and they'll send that off to the lab to get tested. But we didn't even do any of that. Cause we were, they were just like, no, let's just fresh transfer. Let's mm -hmm. get the eggs out. Let's put the sperm in. And then day five, we'll put the embryo in. So that's and what did we you, did. Did you feel like you were being pushed in that direction that, that, that was the, the right thing for you to do? Or did you just, yeah. I yeah. don't know if the right word would be pushed, but it was just, I, it was just like, this is what we do. It's right. the standard. Okay. Like this is yeah, the standard. This is, and the normal. this is the norm. This is the standard, right. you know, what we no do. No reason to do any testing. Right. Right. And you guys yeah. are young. You guys yeah. are young. Yeah. I mean, I think we're worth 32. Yeah. Not, not yeah. over 35. So, right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and we don't nothing. Go ahead. So I was just going to say this whole time, like initially way back when you had your husband tested, but nothing has been tested for okay. him again, up until this point. Nope. Just the semen sample. And okay. um, in genetically through our family, we don't have infertility uh, at all um, okay. or any genetic conditions that would, you would think that we would need to be tested at this right. point. So, yeah. So that wasn't, that was just like, oh yeah, you know, you clearly it's on you. You're the problem. You have a low AMH and, and you had all the scar tissue through endometrial and inflammation and infertility too as well. Right. So they're right, like, it's right. all you. We're like, all right. You know, I took the blame just like most women in this, in this stage take. And that's you know? a really heavy burden to carry too. It is. Yeah. And, and we, in and, and we, because our whole life, that's what we're meant to do. Right. Women are meant to carry the babies and and we're meant to do that. So that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and we choose to take that burden. It's not right. like I isolated my husband out saying, right. you know, and he wanted to, to be a part of that. He didn't want me to feel like it was all me. right. He's right. Kind of a great husband. He's super supportive. And yeah. he's like, oh, give me some of that, you know, and we do, but we're just, you know, we're women yeah. we take on all of it. It's really you hard. Know, it's hard. You feel yeah. a little bit of alone in that mm -hmm. instance. So, yeah, yeah. So I woke up from, the first IVF, they're like, you, you know, you did great. You got six embryos We're gonna transfer two, mm -hmm. uh, fresh, fresh in day five. Okay, great. Come back. Okay. I yeah. come back. They, they put two in, which is not the standard of care as you may find out now, because actually right. that increased your chance of miscarriage. We, we see in the studies that one is bad. Okay. So, um, two are transplanted and then I got a positive HCG. And, uh, obviously I'm ecstatic, like, ecstatic. Yeah. This has been yeah. four years of this, maybe three, four years decimating my timeline. And finally it's actually happening. I just forked out all this money right? <laughs> and, and the pain so and the emotions and right. Yeah. And now you're pregnant. I'm pregnant. I'm totally pregnant. Yeah. So excited. So, um, the weeks move on and you know, you're, you're nervous and you're like looking for bleeding every time you go yeah. to the back everything and being a nurse practitioner that sometimes doesn't help because you know a little bit too much sometimes right, you know right, right. doing all my shots and taking all my pills that you do with IVF and yeah. um at this we did between like six and seven weeks you get an ultrasound mm -hmm. um with the fertility clinic it's normal so I went up there and me, Andre and I go we're super excited and we were just like show everybody like the first ultrasound and you know, 
it's not normal. It, you, there is a, there is a, you know, a, a yolk sac and there is a, a fetal pole, but it's extremely small. It's not really heartbeat. So, you know, obviously right away, I knew what I was looking at. Cause at this point I've been in women's health, you know, working in the, in the field for a while. So right, I know, right. And, you know, it's devastating, obviously yeah. you know, the doctor's trying to say, well, you know, it's still, it can be still early, you know, you could have implanted later, you know, probably not, but you know, that whole thing. So right. I left devastated. I, I remember the feeling to this day because it was the first, it, I mean, all the other blows came and they went and we, but this was, this one was tough. It was a tough one. I just yeah. sobbed the whole way home. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I think I sat on the couch for three days and just didn't want to talk to anybody. Just it was crying. rough. It was yeah. rough. Yeah. So, um, so then I ended up having to have a, uh, was that when I had to have a DNC? Yeah. That one I had. Without a heartbeat irregularity, you know, all that. So, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Think, we're having, we're still having technology problems. So can you repeat that? I think that you cut out for just a minute. So, yes. So, so I, you, I had the DNC yeah, because the, the fetus did grow, but grow without, it grew basically a little bit without a heartbeat and it wasn't right. passing. So around, I think we opted to give it just making sure. And I think around eight weeks is when I had the DNC from mm-hmm. my OBGYN. Right. So then we were back to square one and I still had, um, well, so they ended up letting the other embryos grow out, right? Because of the timeline. And Mm -hmm. so two of them we had lost, didn't end up even making it to day six. And then I had two left at this point. So they said, okay, you know, when you're ready, we'll start, you know, a frozen transfer for this. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, great. So did everything, all the shots, all that kind of stuff. Um, Second transfer of the frozen embryos I had uh, went in. They implanted two. Mm-hmm. Um, day twelve, positive HCG. Hey guys, I'm pregnant, but I was still cautious. I was like excited, right. but like okay, yeah, like I'm getting pregnant. This is great, you know. But yeah. so I hadn't even got week. I think it was like six and a half weeks. I had an ultrasound. I hadn't even gotten there yet, and I mm-hmm. just happened to pee on a a pregnancy test in, in my office because we had a patient there that it was negative and it was like, wait, she thinks she's pregnant, but hers is negative. Is it, do we just have a bad strip of H or of, um, you know, you know, in office strips? Cause that can right. happen. We yeah. just have the basic strips and they can go bad. So it's like, oh, I know I'm pregnant. I'll just go pee on one and see. Right. It was nothing was there. And I was like, oh, maybe these really are bad. No, I, it was basically a blighted ovum then mm-hmm. up you know, I ended up miscarrying after I stopped the progesterone on my own anyway. So, yeah. and my, and my HCG at that time, which went from 30 to like, I think it was like 2,800 in, mm. in and in a, that was kind of indicating something wasn't, you know, correct as well, but they were like, no, it looks good. You're fine. And then, then the, the self miss, you know, the miscarriage. Yeah. Happened. Yeah. Okay. So that's my first IVF story. And my second IVF, I was so, so now we have two miscarriages, yes. right? Two per yeah. two IVF procedures and two miscarriages. Yeah, one IVF for two miscarriages. Right, uh, right, right. Well, gotcha. the transfer. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So what else do you do? You keep going, right? You want right. a baby? You got to keep going. So right. another IVF round. This time I had less follicles. I I think I only had four on the ultrasound, and they're like, oh, you're not doing great. Um, even be your last IVF anyway, because we know your AMH levels low. You may not even get your own eggs anyway, Mm -hmm. again, after this. So you can go for it if you want, but you might not get good results. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, I'm, I am in the middle of all these shots. You know, I'm already tomorrow's supposed to be my surgery day. And you're telling me I can do it if I want, it doesn't look great, but it's up to me. Right. Yeah. So I went for it. And we got two embryos um, and um, they said, you know, let's, um, let's see if they grow at least because, you know, you're the other ones, you know, they, we were, we're not going to do the three day transfer. We're going to do mm-hmm. like day five or six transfer just to see if they even, oh, mm-hmm. I go, this is like going into the weekend. I think it was like 
coming into the weekend, it was a Friday, I remember, and I hadn't heard from anyone yet about the embryos. And so I'm like, well, maybe they're giving it another day. It's day five, I think, or six. And I'm like, I haven't heard from anybody. And finally on Saturday, I called the emergency line and I said, I haven't heard from anybody. Nobody has called me me about anything. And they were like, oh, okay, well, we're going to have the doctor call you. And I was like, oh, okay. And then an hour later, oh, uh, none of your embryos made it. They all didn't make it. And I'm like, Mm -hmm how long have you known this? And they're like, Oh, cause it's now day six or seven. Right. I should have got a call two days ago. Like, right. You know? Yeah. So that happened. Um, and devastating. So, cause I yeah. didn't even get to try it that time, you know? Right. So finally they're like, yeah, well, because you've had, uh, we're really sorry that happened. You know, we, with the, uh, the staff should have notified us and we should, you know, embryo, whoever, somebody should have told you. Well, okay. Right. 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 So then um, they said, you know, it's interesting that you've had two miscarriages now, and then you had these other two embryos not make it at all. So there has to be something going on, maybe chromosomally. And I said, well, we're going to do a chromosome test on your, you and your husband. I said, oh, okay, great. More blood work. And, you know, and at this point, again, I'm not fully in to nurse practicing and fully into infertility. So right, I'm like, right. okay, chromosome test. I mean, honestly, we, in our office, we don't really order chromosome tests in them to MFM maternal fetal medicine or to a fertility specialist too. Right. Cause we just don't want to order the wrong thing or, you know, so I didn't really know. I'm like, oh, we should get our chromosome tested. Right. No idea. Yeah. So yeah. my husband goes and gets it done. I go and get it done. And then two weeks later, the doctor tells me that there's something wrong with my husband. And I'm like, oh, thanks for telling me. So my husband has something called balance translocation. And basically, um, without getting too genetic scientific about it, it's basically you have a DNA chain and two of the DNA chain switched places. So what that means is that he's balanced. Obviously, Mm -hmm. he's thriving. He's a man, but 50%, well, technically it's like 50% is offspring is not compatible with life. And then another 25% would have a significant, or it's like 25% is not compatible with life. 25% would be born with a significant disability if they were born. Mm -hmm. The other 25% will be a carrier for the same gene, but be normal. And then the other 25% would be normal, which all equals hundred. Okay. But we went through all of this stuff this testing to tell us that very crucial piece of information. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so what would you, right. So let's not skip over this. Right. I mean, we would have known that he had this, we would have known that he would to have definitely had to freeze our embryos and do genetic testing on them because, because that percentage of how low my aunt was and how little of eggs that I got, we would have known that the percentage of having one healthy embryo was going to be extremely low. So if we would have tested all those embryos, we would have known why I kept having miscarriages and why those embryos weren't growing normally because they would have, and they would have come back saying that they were either they had this translocation. Right. And that, and that's evident story. I'll tell you later how I know that, um, that would be that way. So that, so instead of ordering those before we even started IUI or I, okay, maybe not IUI, but definitely IVF, right? Right. Definitely at that point. Definitely. Especially with your low AMH, because I think that that's the critical piece that everybody needs to understand. If you have low AMH, and you're going to IVF, you're not, it's not, your eggs are not plentiful. So you're going to have to do whatever it takes to protect them. And, you know, I, I'm not saying, you know, I'm, I hope that this doesn't come across offensively to you. I'm sure Mm -hmm. that you, you know it, but I just want to say out loud that that doctor robbed you of having having the use of your eggs by not genetically testing them. I agree completely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I'm Uh, so sorry that that happened to you because that's. Yeah. And it's, and to go through the two miscarriages, like, right. You know, that hope that you get, you know, 
Absolutely. I would have like, if they would have said, here's the paper and none of these eggs are normal. So we're, we can't put any of them in any way. Right. So yeah. that would have been devastating too, obviously. Right. But in but a different way. In a different way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To go through the actual, like, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant twice to right. not really be pregnant. And then the first time it was, so the second time was it, it miscarried itself, you know, mm. and it, but the first time, like there was a fetus there, you know, it was yeah. there, but it was just not compatible with life. And that was the problem. Right. So yeah, it was, that was when I was like, I'm done. Like I can't mm. stay here. Um, in a state. Not and- to mention, not to mention, but not to overlook the amount of money at this point that you yeah. have both invested into this whole process. I mean, honestly, at this point, we're $150,000 in at this point, which is daunting. I am, yeah. And I am very blessed to have a husband that works in the field that he works. Um, and, and, you know, even still, I mean, we, we, and we don't make that much money, but I am yeah. blessed to be able to put it on a credit card right. to move things around or take out a little bit of equity or something. Right. right? I mean, right. in the state of Florida, fertility is not covered unless mm-hmm. you have an employer that chooses to put it on their insurance. And for people to, to, to afford that is it, you, it's impossible for a lot yeah. of people. And yeah. I'm very, very lucky and very blessed that I could at least in over two years, pay it off, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's, it's a very intense, um, it's, it's very intense for people. It's intense choices for them to make to finance, you know, their infertility that they then may spend the rest of their life, um, the rest of their adult life paying off, you know, yeah. to get, to get the end results. All right. So we have a diagnosis now, this trans, trans balance. uh, Yeah. um, Unbalanced, balanced trans, balanced translocation. Okay. So what Mm -hmm. happens now? Like light bulb has gone off, but now we have a doctor who we feel kind of unhappy with. Right. I'm not, I'm not going back there. We're not going back there. Period. Like it, have to go because again this town is small there's not a, as you know good of I mean yeah. not there's not good ones it's just ones that I wouldn't choose for myself and my, my right. personal family right. um so we said okay well we need to do some investigating we need to figure out we're gonna go see because we gotta go out of state yeah or out of town right so it was fate honestly that I met a patient had gone to um a fertility clinic in Maryland. Um, and so she, and she herself had been through a lot and she had done, she was, she's like me type a personality. We got to do all the research, you know, she right. invested so many fertility clinics around the country she happened to work in ultrasound like sales and stuff. So she was at a lot of these places. And so mm-hmm. she knows, and she's within the inn, Right. So she's yeah. like, a gotta go she's here. seeing behind the scenes. She yeah. knows the doctors. Right. Yes. She's like, you got to go here. They're in the top 10 in the country, maybe even the top five They're Free physician consult, you know, the doctor, my husband is very, um, statistic based. He's mm-hmm. numbers based. Okay. So he wants to know the numbers. He's like, you got to tell me what the percentages are. I want to know, right. like, right. I'm going to go for money. What, what are we going to do? What are we looking at? What are we looking at? So we met with a physician. First, we talked to him online and he kind of went over everything. And basically what happened was he said to my husband and I, unfortunately, you both have been struck by lightning. It's rare that this happens, that to both of something that right. is, you know, causing infertility. And honestly, there the percentage of you having a child together doesn't exist. I mean, honestly, you know, he's like, I don't mean to, you know, be harsh or to break your heart, but he's like, right. just being honest with you, like for you and Andre to have a child together with your genetics and his genetics is basically mm-hmm. possible. I mean, you know, there's a percent chance for everything in life, you right, know, you, right. you don't know, but it's, it's less than 1% if there's right. a chance. So he said, I would recommend donor mm-hmm. embryo. And even, even doing donor, we have to find a donor that's number one, done it before, because we need to know what her history givens is. And, and we need to find meet somebody that gives you a ton of eggs because remember 75% of these embryos are not going to be compatible with life. Right. Right. So we're like, okay, well, let's do it. Here we go. 
you know, that's another hurdle emotionally, mentally that you have to accept within yourself. And then you're like, well, how bad do you want a kid? You know what I mean? Yeah. How bad do you want to be pregnant with a kid? Cause you, right. You know what I mean? But how bad do, do, do I want to be pregnant with a kid? Right. So we're like, all right, let's do it. You know, let's go pick a donor. And you know, that's, that's a whole story in itself. I mean, sure. you go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to find somebody that looks like me. That is like me that, <laughs> the, the fertility clinic I went to has a very large donor database. Mm -hmm. I mean, they get, they accept 3000 applications for donor and they only take 3% because they like really drill it down to health, yeah. you know, everything, you know, That's cause going, yeah. And going through egg donations a lot on somebody's body. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so a lot of people don't make it, even though they start off, you got to give your shots all the time, you know, it's a lot. Yeah. So we were like, all right, let's do it. We went to the database. We're looking, you know, we're kind of excited at this point. And I'm like, I don't see anybody on there. Like, no, nope. nobody looks like me. And he's like, babe, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you just have to pick the one that feels best in your heart. You may not right. find somebody that looks, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And, and, and with this program that we went to, you can do shared risk, which means that you can pick a girl. And if you and two other people could pick her too. And then you do a cycle together. It just keeps it cheaper. But uh -huh. Dr. Lee or our doctor was like, you can do that. Like you need all the eggs for right. because of Andre. Yeah. So we chose somebody. And so he's like, you need to pick somebody who's done it before. Well, mm -hmm. so now we're narrowing the pool down even more. So it's not yeah. just about anymore for lack of a better description, aesthetics or preference. Right. right. Now we have to look for a super producer as well. Yes. so that you have the best possible odds. Let me ask you this before we, um, before we go on, how, how did you feel about that whole thing, grieving, you know, grieving that, that process in that time? Was it, was it just a matter of, I mean, I know it was painful and, right. uh, I'm not trying to, not trying to poke a, a wound, but, yeah. um, was it, for you, was it more hopeful that, Hey, at least we now have an answer. You know, I really want to carry a baby. I'll do whatever it takes. Or was it really intensely a grieving process for you also? Was it both or was it, it was more? Both. Um, I remember going on a walk with my husband after we found out that he had balanced translocation and he, you see, it's me too. And he was happy about that. Like he mm -hmm. was he was happy that there was something to share wrong. the burden. Yeah. And, yeah. and, um, that made me somewhat comforted, but also really sad. Like I, I, you know, because I'd carried this, it's just you burden for mm -hmm. so long. And I didn't want anybody else. You don't want anybody to feel right. That. You don't, and want, you don't want anybody that you love to feel that way too. Exactly. Right. And, but, but then I was like, oh, this is how you, you must be of feeling this whole time. Right. You know, cause you're mm -hmm. so in, in yourself, like it's, you're yeah. doing all the tests and you're having the miscarriage and you're having the DNC. So it's the physical yeah. pain that goes along with it. Right. That you're dealing with, but, right. but, but you take on that emotional pain and for your loved one to watch you do that is hard for them. Cause they can't do anything about it, right. but you don't, right. I don't think about, like, I didn't think about that, you mm -hmm. know, when and, you were going through uh, it, it was just, right. yeah. Cause you're just trying to come together, right? Okay. Yeah. You're trying to cope. You're trying to process. Yeah. yeah. All of it. Yes. Yeah. Just walk, wake up in the morning and go right. to work, you know, right. Just function in and an so, office where you're seeing pregnant women every day. Yes, yes exactly. Every, every, I don't know how you do what you do. I mean, you honestly see people get pregnant every day and 50% of them don't want to get pregnant or they accidentally mm -hmm. get pregnant really it's being thrown in your face. And I'm like, yeah, I, but I love what I do so much. And I was mm -hmm. able to mostly separate that. Right. Um, I was a nurse that you can't, you have to separate their, your, your patient's lives with yours because you can't take it home with you because right, then right. when you get burnt out. So, you know, I'm getting burnt out in nursing. And so that was not as painful, but you're right. It, it, occasionally there was one or two that you were like, seriously, your friends get pregnant. You you're right. very happy for them, but there's some that, that it kills you inside, right? Mm -hmm. It kills you. And then there's right. others. You're like, Oh my God, I'm so happy for them. And who, why? I don't know. Like, why right. did I get more mad about that one? You know, it doesn't, you don't know. It's just the emotions you deal with, but, but yeah. I, I, 
was so sad that he, but he was, he was actually happy because he like, he was like, I can carry this burden with you. You need Mm -hmm. to stop carrying it. That was a huge, you know, realization in our relationship. And, and it just, it was a very strong us, honestly. Um, you got to find that in your relationship. I mean, in the beginning of this fertility journey, we had a lot of conversations and arguments because he, I told him he didn't know how to support me in this journey, but Mm -hmm. he just, I didn't tell him he didn't know how to, because I wasn't letting him support me. Yeah. So it was, it was a learning journey for our relationship is stronger because of it, but it's a lot on a, on a really, on a family, on a husband and a wife or four partners, you know? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So yeah. So the wound, you know, it, it, so it was difficult to move past the step of like Constance have a child that's genetically yours. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what it is. Like, I'm right. never going to have a child that's genetically mine. That looks right. like me. Huge blow to your self-esteem, to your mother, to your motherhood, just to yourself. Like, yeah. you know, and I carried that around for a really long time and, you know, and even through the, even through the whole pregnancy, when I was pregnant with, with my first child, I carried that, like he, he's going to be born and he's not going to look like me, you know, and people are going to say, Oh, he looks just like you. And what are you going to feel? Like, what are you going to think? Are you going to say to him? He's not, you know, Oh, he's not really my, like, what do you do? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, a lot it's, of emotions to process and, um, just things is. that people don't think about, you know, just in general, there's a lot of, <laughs> Like There's a lot of things that come like out of that. people's mouths that they should just not say, right? Yeah, they just don't know. Yeah. yeah. So yes, yeah, so that, but also the place that we had our donor makes you go to a therapy session with a psychiatrist. Fantastic. Fantastic. Because yeah. if that appointment sealed the deal for me and I felt the right thing because she's the words that came out of her mouth, what she said to me was, you are this baby's when you get pregnant, have this baby, you're going to be their biological mother. Okay. So you, they can't live their life without you. Like they're, you're, they're sucking your blood They're You know, you're their biological mother. Yes. You may not be their genetic mother, but you are there and they would not live or be here if it wasn't for you. And not to, you know, I know some people who are watching this may, may not be able to have children at all and may have to adopt, but it, but the therapist will say the same thing. Like that is your right. child. You are the right. mother. It doesn't what matter if it comes from your, from your blood or from your genetics or whatever. Right. You love that child and that is your child. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that helped kind of, that helped me in my story personally right. get over that. I, and I said, she's right. You know, I'm going to be its biological yeah. mother and matter to me. Cause I, yeah. you know, I wanted that pregnancy. Um, so the, yeah, thanks for asking that question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You wanted the experience of the pregnancy, which was, yeah, I wanted you know, it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And, and so I, you know, we, we didn't listen to the doctor, so partially my fault, <laughs> <laughs> but we did not pick a donor that had done it already okay. um, because I just couldn't find somebody felt connected with. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was like, I'm just going to pick this girl. I really like her. I feel a connection with her. She's 22. She's young. Yes. I know she hasn't done it before, but let's see. Well, sad to say it did not work out for her. She ended up on six embryos herself. And they actually had to tell her that she quite possibly had an infertility issue too. So here I am, um, historically Constance Lewis helping others through their infertility journal. Now I journey up now helped this girl find out she's in for her all or you know has it's right. gonna have issues at 22 but here I am more money and right. no embryos right but again I didn't listen to the doctor and pick somebody but you know again hindsight's 2020 yeah the timing yeah. Maybe wasn't meant to be right, right. and so, you've got to be thinking to yourself surely I'm gonna get a break on this you right. know like I'm gonna pick someone everything will be fine Everything will be fine. Everything will be and, fine. Right. So. And, and the doctor was like, Constance, I can't believe what, like you've literally three times. Like this is statistic because he, he, he's a statistics guy. The doctor, yeah. we picked the statistics. It's like statistically, this doesn't happen. I, you're in the one, two percent. And my husband's like, well, that's where we live. We, any, any time something happens, we're like, we live in the one to two percent. That's where we yeah. live. We make a joke of it now because that's yeah. basically what we do. 
Yeah. So then we're like, all right, well, let's start over. Luckily they are extremely kind where I did my fertility treatment and they like gave us a huge discount on the next one. Cause obviously we still have to pay some money because the scroll right. went through something. Right. So we have to pay some money, but they gave us a huge, um, um, on that. So that was really helpful. I mean, I still had to pay, but I had, you know, yeah. I, I had, yeah. so here we go. I, a donor that had done it before and she had a good amount of eggs and we're mm. ready to do it. Okay. So, um, we go for it. She gets, I think 16 total eggs out okay. of after the days go by, you know, how you yeah, first yeah. get like 20 and then it dwindles down and then yeah. the time what's it down, average. Do you know what's average? I think average is probably between 15 to 25. Okay. For a healthy person with a great AMA level. Yeah. Okay. I think she got like 20 and then it dwindled down to like 16 and then it, it kept dwindling down because remember my husband has this balanced translocation. So you're right. only 75% of these embryos aren't right. compatible life, but that's 75% of the ones that make it to day six. Right. Okay? So all along they're dwindling down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So we get to day six and we only have six embryos left out of all this. Okay. Send them off for genetic testing and one comes back normal, just one. And all the other ones are on balance. And that's how I know if they would have checked the other embryos, they would have seen they weren't balanced because right. it was like, oh, this one's 16 and 19 balance. And this, the numbers that he had on balance, those were the balance balances in these, these embryos. Right. So we call him Miracle Miles because he was our one. We had one, the embryo. one good we egg, like, oh, one right. good egg, right. one little little egg. Let's put it in and see what happens. And that's Miles, my three year old that I have today that we call Miracle Miles because yeah. out of all that, I have we got chills, one. have goosebumps. Yeah, no. yeah. So, so, but let's not skip. Let's not yeah. skip over the part. So yeah. they do the transfer, right? And but now we're the rose colored glasses are off. Okay. Right. 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 So you know that he's a healthy embryo and right. how, are, how was that waiting time for you until you so, could see the first ultrasound and all of that? So I, I still, I did not accept the fact that I was pregnant until my baby was born. Honestly, yeah. um, I, the fear was there the entire pregnancy sure. and, um, I, and I didn't connect. I, and it, it's sad to say this, but I didn't feel connected to my baby until he was born. Mm -hmm. um, and even a little bit after that, I struggle with postpartum uh, anxiety of losing him. So yeah. we'll talk about that later, but yeah, there's a lot of infertility patients go through that. Sure. Um, so yeah, so very cautiously excited, but not even, I mean, I was happy, but I still wasn't right. letting myself get excited. And yeah. um, I'm very, have an ultrasound in my office where I work. So, yeah. and, I, and I have a Doppler in my office right. where I work. So I'm obsessively checking things, right. you know what I mean? After everything. You're like after. clock in, check the baby's heartbeat, yep. go to yep. lunch, put the yep. Doppler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm I mean, like, what's the sound tech? Are you here today? Come on over. She's yeah. like, oh my God, my poor office. I mean, they were so good to me, but they're like, yeah. here's the crazy patient coming in again. I mean, <laughs> I work there and they called me the crazy patient. I'm like, all right, whatever. You can call me crazy. Yeah. Call me whatever you want. Just <laughs> Let me see the baby. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's why when I have patients come in, I understand. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, we can do an ultrasound. But I mean, yeah. I know a lot of offices that are like, well, you got to pay for it or no, you're not due for it. But I don't like my office isn't like that. We will do right. an ultrasound for you because we just know we, I, my doctor has seen it and he knows the feeling from me and, yeah. you know, we just know how it feels. So yeah, the intensity of it is, is yeah. overwhelming. And it, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so you have your miracle mile. I'm here. So, you know, as the time goes on and things, right. you know, we find out it's, it's a boy, you know, yeah. and that helped make it somewhat more real for me, I think. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so everything was good in the pregnancy. I had some preterm labor symptoms a little bit early on and had to go on a little bit of bed rest for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. We had to do some pretty typical, right? And um, so then he came, miracle miles, we call him. And then, um, you know, uh, say, you know, this, a lot of infertility patients, like your, your chance of going through postpartum depression and anxiety is, is statistically higher if you've gone right. through infertility. Right. Uh, and if, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And so being a nurse practitioner, and this is another thing that I want women to listen and listen loud is that I am a women's health nurse practitioner mm -hmm. did not catch 
my own postpartum anxiety, depression, and it got severe. And my family was like, at six months of his birth, he was born, you know, he's six months old. He, they yeah. were finally like, you need to, you need help. Like, this is not healthy. You're not healthy. Yeah. And mine was more anxiety. I had a fear of him dying a lot. Yeah. Like I probably had five, 20 thoughts a day, visualizing him being dead, um, oh in the gosh. pool, hitting his head. Like, and, and I just thought, Oh, new moms go through, like they have yeah. their, their fear of losing their baby. But that infertility part comes in because you're like, you went through a miscarriage and you couldn't right. get pregnant and every, all these bad things happen. So now you're right. like more bad stuff's going to happen. Right. Right. And so that's what you, that's what I went through. And, and yeah. not everybody goes through that, but I did go through that intensely. Yeah. And so that's interesting. That. I have not heard that statistic, but that it makes total sense. I mean, intuitively know that that happens and it happened to me too. I had, um, terrible anxiety with my first, I literally thought everything was going to kill him. Yep. Like it just, yeah. So, you know, you're just, there's not even a word for it. It's, it's beyond helicopter mom. Yeah. It's, you know, it you just are so concerned for your baby all the time and couldn't, yeah. couldn't stand to probably the same for you. Couldn't stand to hear him cry, right. yes. you know, it, and just, yeah, it was all of that. And, you know, and he's three now, right. Yeah. Three and a half. So you're going through the terrible twos and, but, but sometimes people will say, you know, oh, you need to be a, like you, you know, he kind of gets away with a lot, not away. Like he's a good kid and we, or yeah. we discipline him, but listen, but I was, I could have been maybe, you know, I was a little bit looser on him or stuff, or I was more cuddly and huggy. If he got yeah. hurt, if he got hurt, I was like, oh, come here. Let me, you know, yeah. again, that's all you can that's everybody's, you know, mothering status and how they mother their children and discipline yeah. their children. But, yeah. but that also fed into it because, you know, even my own mom and dad sometimes will say, well, you know, you could be a little bit tougher on him. He's getting away with some things. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but, but you know what, like it came from that. It came from right. that infertility journey and the scare of losing him every day that, that that's why when he cried, I was right. Yeah. I was right there, you know? Yeah it's total opposite with my second. I'm like, Oh, she fell down again. <laughs> yeah, right. I right. walk away. I'm like, yeah. man, I have a terrible, is she, but oh, is she bleeding? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, is your bone coming out? You're bleeding. You're good. And I just, I'm like, it's so different with your, yeah. I don't know if it's because of it's your second or your, it's, you know, I, I know. think, I think it's survival. Honestly, yeah. I think it's the survival mechanism because if, if you lived under that kind of intensity with multiple children in your house, you just, you couldn't function. Right. I mean, exactly. it would just be, um, and with your first you're you got, it's just you and that right. kid, you know, yep. yeah. mm -hmm. every, every waking second, <laughs> every sleeping second, every non-sleeping yeah. second, right. Every non-sleeping <laughs> second. All yeah. right. Well, we have to, um, finish your story. Okay. Yeah. With wrapping up with your daughter. Yeah. So the finishing part to that story was another yeah. emotional hurdle that I had to get over. Yeah. So yeah. we wanted more children. Um, we wanted to do it again. And remember, we only had one embryo. So, right. well, we got to pick, an, we got to pick, we got to get a donor. Okay. So my thought in my head is like, okay, we're going to get the same donor. Mm -hmm. It's going to go great. You know, we'll at least get one embryo again. You know, you think all this stuff and right. then it happened this way before this is, it's going to go this way again. Yes. And yeah. it's going to go again. So they told me that that donor was not available at this point now over the age of 35. And she had already done, you know, I guess they have a limit on how many donations. They mm -hmm. do. Yeah. And so she had met that limit and I like literally ca like called the head because the doctor that we were seeing, it's a huge, huge, huge practice in multiple States. But the doctor mm -hmm. that I saw was a co-founding member, like he founded the practice. So he's Amazing. got, he's yeah. the big kahunas of right. make things happen if things can happen. So I'm like, I'm like calling him back and I'm like, please, can you just make an exception? And he's like, I would love to, but it's, it's her safety. And, you know, and I got that, I, yeah. I get that, you know? And so. So here's another safety. loss to get over. Another loss. And, and this one hurt more than the first, like, don't like it for some reason it hurt more. I don't know why I think like, I think about like, if they looked different or when they get older, you know, genetic wise, like I have to tell them they have different don't, you know what I mean? It, that yeah. one was harder for me. I don't know why, but it took me a couple of months to really process that yeah. and kind of accept it. And I mean, cause I'm like, at one point I was like, let's just not do it. And yeah, 
wanted. Well, we talked a little bit about it because it wasn't you anymore. You felt like you were doing something to Miles, right? And that you right. couldn't give something to him that you wanted to give him, which was a a full That's sibling. It. Right. Yeah. yeah. I have a brother and um, I love it. And it's that. And I always think about like, if, if you, you know, and even, even going on, if you have a third and one, you lose one, then you only have one or you only, you know, who would they have? You know, you think yeah. about all that stuff. Yeah. So, so I'm like, okay, let's fork out. Let's do it again. You know? And so I, it did take me a while to, to, to accept that I would be picking a different owner and yeah. picked one that had done it already. And she was stellar. I mean, I got 33 eggs from her. She wow. did. Yeah. Amazing. Like she was one of their top donors, um, egg wise, egg count wise. And, um, going through the whole process again. And we actually had nine embryos that were normal nine. Wow. That's a, that's um, a lot. That's yeah. a lot. And so we picked, we just picked rate them, at, uh, based on how well, they, how good they look like there's sure. A's, B's, you know, there's a rating system. So we just said, Oh, pick the best one. That's on the top of your rating system. We don't want to know what it is. We just want you to put it in. I'm superstitious because now the fertility clinic that to, um, you know, out of state it now has some places in this area. So I can go there and not go out of town. I'm like, Nope, I'm not. <laughs> You're like, I'm getting hotel. on a plane and I'm getting on the same day. I'm going to go to the same place. I'm yeah. going to the same food restaurant, you know, yeah. crazy. And, um, so we did. And, um, then that's how Mariah happened. And I was, I was able to with her while she was on the inside. I think I was more accepting and less fearful, but I was still somewhat fearful. I did have some sure. weeks with her. Um, and I actually, she was a, it was a twin pregnancy actually. So oh, okay. there, it, yeah. So one embryo went in, but it split. And then, um, so we lost the, um, other embryo. We don't know if it would have ever became an actual feet, you know, fetus infant, or if it was just a blighted ovum, because by the mm -hmm. time we got to the ultrasound, it was already um, shrinking the sack. But, um, so we did, I did have some bleeding at five, five weeks. That was a little scary. And, um, yeah. but what, and then the pregnancy was, was less scary and, um, I was a lot sicker, but it was less scary. And <laughs> yeah. And then she came and she's here, Mariah. And, uh, you know, I, it's just, it's different because it's the second kid and I yeah. didn't have, and I reckon I did have, still have some postpartum, but I recognized it and I didn't have to go on medications this time for it. And I was mm -hmm. able to cope better because I'd kind of done the work ahead of time. Right. And, um, with a therapist and things like that. And, um, I just, you, people ask me, do you think on a daily basis, like they're not genetically yours? And I don't think about that at all. No. I mean, I just look at them and I'm just in love with them. And yeah. Those and are your babies. Those are my babies. And yeah. yes, sometimes I, s people will say, oh, you know, they look, she looks like you or he looks like you or, or whatever they say. And I just say, thank you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. yes, I do get it. I don't get a pain. I get like, a, oh yeah. Like, I, I don't know. I can't explain you know, that. I feel like it's just God working it out. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. that people and people want to make that kind of connection and stuff. I have one of my children is um, very different coloring than mm -hmm. the rest of the family. And it's funny because people will say to me, like people are always trying to figure out things, you know, and yeah. they'll say to me like, well, my least favorite one is, oh, it must be the milkman's baby or something. And I'm like, do you really know what, you, what you're like actually saying to me right now? It's super yeah. offensive, it but is. you know, um, yeah, they say, I know that you have equally dumb things said to you, but people will say that to me because he looks different than his brothers and us, but he's, I'm like, I, I, I like to say, well, genetics are fun. I don't know what to tell you. No, like he, we, we all have dark hair and he's a toe head blonde. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Like, it's just how the, gen, how the genetics right. rolled the dice, it's yep. just, you know, yeah. you see it. and you know, me, when I have mixed children, you know, yeah. and, and the funny thing is, is that, um, picked, obviously we're white women. Um, yeah. they both have blonde hair though, which is like, mm -hmm. I can't find anybody that looks like me. Well, they all had blonde hair for some reason. It yeah. was, that was in the donor pool. And, and my, my son has uh, when he was born, he had black hair, but it all fell out and it, it's blonde. It was blonde. It grew back in blonde and straight uh -huh. as blonde curly hair. It's starting to fade now, but right. when my husband would take him out, 
you know, they would be like, you know, say things or even, even um, I, I was with him at one point and they were like, oh, how did he get so tan? He's so tan. And I just, and I said, oh, his dad's black. And they just <laughs> look at me, you know, <laughs> they just look at me like, oh, 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 you know, you know, I just, I just like, oh, that's black. Yeah. Well, but it's not an accurate. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. They're like, he has blonde hair. I'm like, yeah, it's genetics. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I just, you hear it. I just, people are so funny and they don't, yeah. so, they don't mean to, I don't think right. they just, you're right. It's, they don't think about it, but yeah, I don't, but when they say they look like you, I don't, I don't get sad. I think, I, I think I feel, I feel like not sadness, but I'm kind of like, oh yeah, you know, th I'm like, thank you. Like, I love that you're saying that and you think that and inside I'm kind of like, yeah, they're, oh, it's all right. You know, but, but also yeah. when you grow a baby inside of you, epigenetics is the thing too. So yes. they can take your personality and your, you right. know what I mean? So absolutely. Yeah. Environment and all the, all that too. So yes. yeah. So it, that's my, my journey. And I'm here to, I was, I think I told it, I told you Erica before that the reason that I think that I was, I, I went through all of this is because I meant to help so many other people. Absolutely. Um, that's why I was put here, not solely, but why I do the job that I do and mm -hmm. why I love it so much. Um, why I had to endure so much pain and go through so much was, it was for right. a purpose is how I look at it. Yeah. Um, how, how I choose to look at it. It's a gift that I can give back to others. So. Absolutely. And yes, thank you for reaching back um, into the fire just by doing this video and sharing your story. It's yeah, going to help so it. many women, um, you know, just understand how to advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I have one last question for you. We've gone really long, but that's okay. Yeah, sorry. I just, no, no, uh, I'm just saying that because, um, I just want to know, um, what would you like to see change in the infertility world and the reproductive endocrinology role? I have my own, um, uh, I have my own feelings and opinions about that, but what would you like to see change, um, in terms of testing and limitations and things like that? Yeah. Cause I know that we had talked a little bit about, Ad, uh, you know, kind of creating a, a, a movement against this so that yeah. there's. I'm excited to create a movement with you. I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that the education is by far the most important. I am an educator. I was an educator. My father's an educator. I just mm -hmm. think education is, is how you can make in most cases, right? Yeah. So, so OBGYNs need to be educated on infertility, first of all, because that's going to be a patient's first stop. Okay. Right. Um, and, and so there's, I've had so many patients come to my office as a second opinion. And I look at the, the treatment plan or the plan of care for their fertility. It's like something opposite of what I would order. Not that right. I know everything either. Like, you know what I right. mean? And, and not that I'm perfect. Cause I'm, I'm constantly updating my, I'm constantly calling my like fertility clinics and I have a go-to fertility clinic that I yeah. call the doctor and I'm like, tell me what the newest stuff is. Tell me what I'm missing. Right. Cause it right. changes yeah. all the time. I mean, the, the progesterone level things changing now, right. like it's just a whole different thing. So I'm yeah. constantly figure it out. So I can give that basic fertility care, but it comes yeah. from education. So OBGYNs need to be responsible to, if they're going to fertility in their office, they need to be educated on how to see fertility in their office. Right. Yeah. And they need to follow some sort of standard of care or diagnostics checklist that, you know, we have one in our office. Like these are the things that we mm -hmm. go through and the steps, you know, if this happens or this happens in this, so we're not missing, yeah. things, you know, and, and. Uh, I don't want, and so holding on to those patients too long is what happens. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think if I would have been sent to a fertility specialist a little bit earlier and also one that test did the tests that were supposed right. to be done before yeah. I had everything done, I think that that would have saved me at least two years and a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Um, which we talked about, like they didn't test you. Right. They're not giving you a refund. Right. So Right. We've had this conversation, you know, both of us feel that that's predatory, you know, right. towards the patient that, um, after the fact they say, well, we could have tested for this, or we should have tested for that. And meanwhile, you 
forked out all this money and mm -hmm. the money is one thing, but it's really the emotional um, toll that it takes on you and your family. And honestly, let's be fully honest. Yeah. Some people run out of money and emotion. Like right. they can't, they, they can't do. get, they run out of money. And then they, if they have the money, they can't emotionally go on after having miscarriage after miscarriage, even if they know what's wrong, even if they feel like they can fix it, they can't roll those dice one more time. So you are very, and you know, people are like, well, and don't get me wrong. Like the kids that I have were chosen, they were given to me, right. They yes. were the chosen ones. And so, yes, maybe if I hadn't gone through all of this and it had been done, right. Would I've gotten these kids, but you can't like, you got to look at it. Yes. Okay. But I did go through this. I have the kids that I have, but I don't right. want anybody else to go through this. Like I want right. It to you want done. people to have choices too, right? That choice was he taken educated. away from you by the timeline and by, you the know, money. the money and also, you know, your eggs not being properly cared for. I don't right. know what else to say other than that. Yeah, but, no, they were, yeah, they yeah. weren't, they really weren't like it just, it, you're right about it. Yeah. So yeah. that I, that's what I want to see. I want to see some sort of, it just, like I said, it comes back to education. Like you have to be educated. Um, the patient needs to be educated. Yeah. Like it's hard for like if you're not medical and I was medical and right. I still went through all this. So, yes. I mean, it's, it's hard to, if you're not met, you know, be your own advocate, if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't, yeah. you know, you know, try to figure it out. Um, so yes, that, but the change of standards, like standards of care, like some sort of checklist or some mm -hmm. sort of thing that like, if you go to a fertility clinic and um, these are the steps that they have or you even right. sign the, the line of uh, IVF and giving yes. them the money. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, That's I think, really what I would like to see too. Um, you know, yeah. I talked to another girl a week or so ago, they were transferring for IUI and her endometrium was six. Yeah. You know, yeah. and why transfer? It's not thick enough. I mean, right. and she was on the table. She was an ultrasound sonographer knowing what she was looking at. And they, they, you know, reassured her that it was fine. And those are the kind of predatory things that we're, that we're looking at. And, you know, doctors are just people and they're not, not everybody is trustworthy, you know? Right. So. Yep. I agree. I, I want to see Paul, uh, Florida change with insurance. That's a big one that we yeah. got to, I want to try to figure out how to get on that, that bandwagon of trying to yeah. get that bill passed fertility to some extent needs to yeah. be covered, you know, at least. Um, and then the other thing is just, um, like you said, the, the checklists of what people have to do before. And, and I also am super, super um, supportive of mental health and what mm -hmm. I went through in postpartum right. depression and things. So I, I really think that you are, you should be required to some extent to see a counselor within the, like a fertility mm -hmm. clinic should have a counselor on site and more and of that. a holistic approach yeah. too. Yeah. A holistic yeah. approach like to help you like, okay, you're getting ready to go through this process. Like IVF it's intense. Yeah. You're going to have these emotions. Let's, right. let's talk about them. What are your fears? What are you like? Just somebody yeah. that can walk them that they feel comfortable talking to. And like, you know, I know not everybody believes in counselors. I get that, but I just think right. that that should be in place. Um, and they mandated that we saw a counselor in order mm -hmm. to go through donor IVF. I mean, they, I don't a, think what they, a blessing for you, right? Yeah, absolute yeah. blessing. I don't think they mandated it in my place for like just regular IVF, you know, your, your I think mm -hmm. donor, but I think it needs to be across the board because truly I think that's something, the mental health piece, um, that goes into it. And they can also be aware that if you do have this child, postpartum anxiety and depression may be an issue too. Right. Right. Well, I cannot thank you enough. I, um, am so happy to share your story and have been looking forward to it all week. And, um, oh, okay. thank you for your time. Um, if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. So you can get more content like this. Constance, I have a feeling that we'll be doing some more work together. So yes, I do too. I'm very <laughs> excited. And, um, I look forward to the questions. Please feel free to ask me any question. I love that kind of stuff too. So if you ever need anything, you can contact me. I'm always here. You can get, get me through Erica. Okay. Excellent. Health and blessings to you guys. Same to you. I hope. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.